Our next writer is Dan Klefstad, and he interviews regional authors for NPR, WNIJ's monthly Read With Me series. He's also, I think, a morning, a frequent morning host, right, at, at WNIJ. Um, tonight's excerpt is from Shepherd and the Professor, his first print novel. His short story, The Caretaker, recently appeared in the journal Crack the Spine, issue number 209. He lives and writes in DeKalb, Illinois, and Williams Bay, Wisconsin. You can purchase his books at Amazon.com slash Dan dash Clefstad. It's in your program. Or tonight at the special waterline price of $15. Dan? Thank you, Ann. I think this will be about right here. Can you hear me okay? Um, the title of the book, uh, the novel, is Shepherd and the Professor. It is the fictional memoir of a woman named Susan Shepherd, and most of the book is entirely about her. However, Susan wants to introduce you to the man who uh, knocked her up and left her three weeks later, uh, a professor named uh, Daniel Lazar. Um, there's another character here, an NPR reporter, and there will be uh, a bartender as well in this, uh, in this excerpt. Oh, the year 1993, the place Charters, Illinois, a fictional university town, and Susan Shepard picks up the story. My hometown has an identity problem. The maps and highway signs call it Chart, like the town in France, but people who live here call it Charters. No one uses the French pronunciation anymore, except snooty visitors who took a semester of Francais and think we don't know the name of our goddamn town. It's like visiting Notre Dame University and calling it Notre Dame. Only an asshole would do that. <laughs> Which brings me to Daniel and my story about how I let a total stranger knock me up and abandon me three weeks later. It's 1993 and I'd like to introduce him as I imagine him a few hours before we met. Look at him, stranded on the exit ramp, tall and thin, wearing a tweed blazer in the middle of August. He's unlike anyone I've ever seen, helpless next to the steam leaking from the front of his Jaguar. I like how the rising cloud partially obscures the sign that says, Welcome to Charters, home of Otto Kerner University. Would look great if it were a movie. Daniel shields his eyes from the sun as he looks north toward the Amico station, now a BEP. Poor baby. Look at him. How helpless he is. The only child of famous professors, Daniel Lazar grew up with nannies, private schools, the works. His parents were often away doing research or presenting papers, but Daniel was never alone. He had a cook, a maid, and a tutor for every subject. Both parents taught at the University of Chicago and wanted him to study under their watchful eyes, or rather those of their teaching assistants. So every day the TAs reported on his attendance, mood, class participation, and who he hung out with. The last category was almost always blank. Between classes he hid in the library, reading Chaucer, Shakespeare, Austin, and Yeats. In the evening, he ordered dinner delivered to his single occupancy dorm where he wrote his essays. Fridays, the family driver picked him up and delivered him and his laundry to the lakefront tower where the doorman greeted him by name and the maid and cook waited in the top floor apartment. Still, life wasn't always so insular for our hero. Shortly after turning 21, he left his household staff behind. <gasps> and moved to England, where as a Rhodes Scholar, he studied at Oxford. By this time, he got comfortable eating with other students. He even started drinking socially in actual pubs with real common folk, although he barely understood their low form of speech. During this time, he must have been getting laid a lot because he was quite experienced when we got together. But none of this mainstreaming, if we can call it that, prepared Daniel for the real-world place of charters, where at 26, he arrives to take his first J-O-B. Which takes us back to that stranded Jag, and an approaching Honda, which slows, veers onto the shoulder, and stops. A man about the same age gets out, 
leans against the open door. Looks like someone overdressed for work. First day at the university? I am starting a new position, yes. Daniel wipes his forehead with a handkerchief. It's my first day too. I'm a reporter for the NPR station. You heard of WOKU? No. I'm guessing you're a professor, liberal arts? My tweed is a dead giveaway. The stranger continues, yes, but houndstooth is very specific. Herringbone could be philosophy, journalism, anything. You got elbow patches. Do you always interrogate strangers? I said I was a reporter, didn't I? Daniel walks toward the hood of his car. I did not agree to be interviewed. Argumentative, could be history. Reporter's eyes follow him, eh, but the patches suggest otherwise. He scratches his head. Houndstooth plus patches equals theater prof. If you're suggesting I'm gay, be warned. I know judo. <laughs> okay. Reporter watches as Daniel feels around the hood. Now I'm told I don't have an off switch. It's one of the risks of a calling like journalism. Daniel smirks. A calling is a deeply inspired belief or some special insight into the human condition. Daniel pulls on the hood. Priests and poets have a calling. Journalism is just a profession. Oh, great, another fucking English professor. Reporter watches Daniel lift the hood and disappear into a cloud of steam. He looks at his watch. Benefits orientation starts in 30. Want a ride? I'll just tell him I want the Cadillac plan. You'll pay a lot more out of pocket. Daniel scoffs. They didn't call it the Honda, did they? Well, the Honda is still working and is leaving in a couple of minutes. Daniel's head emerges from behind the raised hood. Do you have any water or soda? I have beer. What's the alcohol content? 5%? That shouldn't combust. Daniel waves the steam from his face. How many bottles do you have? It's in cans, but I'd read the owner's manual first. Who'd read that childish prose? Daniel puts the handkerchief over the radiator screw. Christ, this thing's hot and tight. Reporter approaches. They write that prose so even a child would know to stop what you're doing. You hear that, Jane? Daniel pats the fender. The reporter with a year of shop class thinks he can fix you better than a PhD. We'll show him. Reporter walks over and grabs his arm. I'm telling you, you're about to kill yourself. Daniel's nose twitches. He smells alcohol, tobacco, and stomach acids. I told you, I know judo. <laughs> no, you don't. Back off, inebriate. What did you just call me? Daniel's eyes narrow. I reiterate. Repor reporter makes a move, and that's when Daniel grabs the fabric around the stranger's left shoulder and right side, turns and curls his leg behind reporter's right leg. Then, before he can execute the ashigaruma, or leg wheel, reporter punches him. When Daniel comes to, he hears a hissing sound. He sits up, rubs his jaw, and looks around and realizes he's been dragged 30 feet. Back near the jag, reporter is inspecting the ground which steams around his shoes. He lifts a garter snake with a stick and throws it at Daniel. The rubbery carcass lands next to him, eyes and mouth frozen in agony. Fuck your PhD, reporter walks to him. Yeah, I had a year of shop class where I learned to read the fucking manual. He hauls Daniel to his feet. Daniel sniffs. You're drunk and a good thing too. No sober man would help you. Daniel's still angry, but eases up when he looks at the snake. I suppose I should thank you. You can send a fifth of Johnny Walker to my room. I'd prefer to send breath mints, but I won't argue. What's your name? Guy Severson. Daniel stares at him. Mr. Severson, are you sober enough to give me a lift? Inside the Honda, Daniel squints as ashes fly out the ashtray into the crosswind of open windows. On the floor, between his shoes, rolls half a dozen empty beer cans. They pass a homemade sign that says, Don't say Chartres, this ain't France. The idiots around here. Daniel leads his hand, head out the window and shouts, It's pronounced Chart! He leans back. Hicks. Quiet, you'll get us killed. Guy slows as they approach a corrugated metal building a mile from the business district. 
When I interviewed for the job, I found this townie bar with super cheap booze. You thirsty? I could go for a beer, something imported. Guy pulls into the parking lot of Buzz Me. You won't find any imports here. Buzz Me. God, what a place. Owner, manager, Popsy Wooten stocks his bar with bottles that decent places wouldn't put on their bottom shelf. The handle on his tap draws Budweiser and nothing else. Go time is 4.55. Popsy lines up dozens of two ounce plastic shot glasses and fills them with whiskey or tequila, whatever is cheapest. Then he pulls the tap and fills the 16 ounce cups, hurriedly setting them on the counter and splashing foam all over the place. At exactly five o'clock, workers pour out of the Del Monte cannery, the Charters tool and die, and the GE factory. Each business is five minutes away. Workers at the grain elevator are 15 minutes away, but they knock off at 4.45 to avoid a warm chaser. They all roar into the parking lot at the same time, walk to the bar, pay their dollar, shoot their rot gut, and salve their throats with cool beer. Then they push their big cups and their little cups toward Popsy again, slam down another dollar, and hit repeat. Most say, hey, Popsy, at this point, and recite the same dirty joke they told yesterday. An hour later, you could set your watch by it. Someone starts a fight, and everyone rushes in to get a piece. Long as no weapons appear, Popsy keeps his shotgun behind the counter next to the smelling salts he uses to revive the unconscious. This evening, he watches a battered Honda parked between matching monster trucks. Moments later, two men walk in, one with a cigarette, one without. Popsy recognizes the smoker as he approaches the counter. Guy Severson barely makes eye contact as he leans in. Your house special needs a name. Can I recommend one? What's that? Popsy turns an ear toward him. The one bug fuck up. Popsy frowns. You said that last month. Yeah, but it's still good, isn't it? I guess. Tell you what, give me a free pitcher and I'll give you the rights to the name. We have big cups and we have little cups. How about a free combo? Popsy leans in. Did you get the job? Uh, yeah, I did. How much you gonna make? Never mind. Pop guy opens his wallet. Popsy grabs him by the wrist. How much you gonna make? 25. 25 grand? You get insurance? Guy nods. What about vacation? That too. Guy puts down a dollar. That'll be 10 bucks. What the fuck for? You can afford it. Guy closes his wallet. I can also find another bar. Uh-uh, Popsy wags his finger. One word, you'll be tonight's entertainment. He tilts his head toward a pair of twins wearing mullets and cut off shirts, like Billy Ray Cyrus back in the day, only dirtier and with bigger arms and more ink. Popsy grins, revealing a gold tooth. Understand? Guy looks at his neighbors and, uh, without a word, slides a ten across the counter. Popsy grabs it, sets down the drink combo. What about your friend? He work at the college, too? Uh, go easy on him. His car just broke down. Yo, professor, what can I get you? Daniel ignores the bud handle, eyes scanning the empty space behind Popsy, looking for a beer menu or sample bottles. Do you have Cronenberg? He smiles, showing teeth that are white and perfect. I'd like a French beer for my first drink in Chart. <laughs> Thank you.